Yeah, we have a lot of cancer. The Lund Lectures. These lectures have been going on since 1960. They are in honor of uh, the New Testament scholar here at North Park from 1922 to 1954, uh, Dr. Niels Lund. And uh, they, uh, they are a, a great treasure uh, and we're honored by our scholars. I'm not introducing scholars, I'm just introducing the series to you this morning. But uh, we're honored by the scholars and this is the front end of the symposium. This is going to be a very rich uh, weak intellectually and spiritually here at, uh, at North Park. Um, the, uh, his work uh, that was published in 1941 by Chapel Hill, Chiasmus in the New Testament, um, is an interesting piece. He was one of the, the early discoverers of the inverted, as it was called at the time, the inverted structures in scripture. And, uh, uh, and really, uh, his work uh, got more, more notoriety uh, in the 1980s and forward uh, than, it did, uh, than it did when it first came out. In fact, when I first became dean here uh, four years ago, um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina Press called and asked if, they, if we had a copy that we could, uh, they could use to make an e-book of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of it. And so it's still, it's still out there and still being sought and, uh, and used. Uh, I want to say to the students, uh, he, uh, the book was published in 1941, but uh, he began his studies here in 1908, and the discovery of that structure and his whole life's work in this area began uh, writing a paper for New Testament here at North Park in 1908. So who knows where, where all of your work and your reading and your studies will, will take you in, uh, in the world of scholarship. So we're delighted uh, that you're here for these lectures. I'm going to uh, turn it over to, uh, to my colleague, Jay Phelan, who's going to introduce uh, our first lecturer. And uh, we're delighted you're here. Thanks. In addition, I want to greet those who are watching via live stream. We're glad to have you with us as well. Uh, and when the time for questions come, uh, both uh, you here in the audience uh, and those on live stream will be able to ask questions. So we look forward to, to hearing from all of you and uh, having this interaction uh, with our speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Susan Eastman. Dr. Eastman is uh, Associate Research Professor of New Testament at the Divinity School, Duke University. Uh, she did her own doctoral work at Duke with Richard Hayes, uh, perhaps one of our most outstanding New Testament scholars of this or any generation. Her focus of her research and writing has been on Paul, uh, especially focused on Pauline anthropology and identity and identity formation uh, in Paul, and any of you that have worked with Klein Snodgrass knows why, know why he is here this morning, because this is one of his great interests and concerns as well on the matter of identity and participation in Paul. She's the author of many articles and scholarly journals, edited volumes, as well as materials uh, for the ser in service of the church. Her forthcoming book from Erdman's is entitled Reframing Paul's Anthropology. 
In addition to her academic work, Dr. Eastman is an ordained priest in the Episcopal Diocese of Alaska uh, and is presently resident clergy and preaches regularly at the Church of the Holy Family in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. In addition to the lectures that she is giving this morning, she will also be uh, giving a paper later at the uh, North Park Symposium on Religion and Science uh, later this week. And if you want to attend that uh, and have not yet signed up or not yet uh, let Gaila know, uh, please do. We uh, would enjoy having as many of you there as possible. Uh, we're very pleased that Dr. Eastman is with us. Please, let's give her a warm North Park welcome. Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, have a chance to, to think together about some crucial ways in Paul, which Paul does talk about identity. And I'll just say briefly before I get into the topic for this lecture, how I got into this, because it might be of interest to you. I, I went into the academic study of Paul after working as a pastor. Uh, for many years. And so the questions that I brought to my research were questions that came from life experience, <laughs> more than questions recycled through the uh, mill of academic uh, cause and effect um, conversations. And so among those questions were how to preach Paul and how Paul might actually be a resource for people in distress. And I think that that has been a lifelong matter of urgent concern and passion for me because I think Paul's gospel is radical good news. I've always, I'm a fan of the guy. Um, not everybody is, but I am. <laughs> and, um, and so I was looking at questions of um, identity formation from the very beginning. And <clears throat> among those questions in my earlier work, I wrestled with imitation because Paul uses imitation language a lot. And what I found in the scholarly circles was that there was a divide between th people who thought imitation was a good thing and people who thought imitation was a bad thing. <laughs> imitation as a good thing meant that if you imitate Paul and the saints, you will become more holy. Imitation as a bad thing was that Paul is making everybody imitate him and he's being a paternalistic, chauvinistic jerk in doing so, making infantile congregations. What I noticed was that nobody questioned the idea that imitation was something we choose to do as individuals. The idea that we could choose and we would choose whether or not to imitate Paul or anybody else. And simply because I've lived a little, I thought, but that's not true. In fact, when we imitate, we hardly know we're doing it. Children imitate their parents without being aware of it. Uh, people imitate cultural icons without being aware of it. Whole economies run on this mimetic power. So I started looking at this, and I started reading about imitation and mimesis in the ancient world, and I also started reading about it in contemporary work. And I found a very rich, very rich discussion around how imitation and participation go together psychologically and culturally, how we participate by imitating, even though we don't know we're imitating. Plato knew all about this. It's nothing new. So that got me into the question of participation and identity, which, if I'm not careful, I'll knock that off, which is um, what I'm, I, uh, has taken me into questions of reframing Paul's uh, anthropology. Um, in conversation, not only in, in my work, I have this book coming out with the ancient world, but also in conversation with current work in neuroscience and in uh, cognitive sciences, experimental psychology, philosophers that engage with the cognitive sciences and so forth. You'll get a little taste of that in um, the lectures this morning. A basic question, which is the lifelong question, how do people change and how is our change sustained over time? These are questions that any pastor has to ask. And they're questions that anybody working in, in any of the caring fields has to ask. And they're questions that anybody remotely awake has to ask. <laughs> 
how do we change? Can we change? How is change sustained over time? How is our identity formed and reformed in such a way that we remain ourselves and yet we become radically different? These are the kinds of questions that animate my work. So this morning I'll talk a bit about bodies in the first lecture and a bit about cognition in the second lecture. And um, I will then be very happy to hear any questions or comments afterwards. So being bodies, Paul's body language and ours. So when I was in college a few decades ago, it feels like a few centuries ago, but really it was only decades, there was an extremely popular book that circulated widely. It was unofficially required reading for young women of my generation, almost a manifesto that grew out of conversations among women aged 23 to 36 in Boston in 1969. The title was Our Bodies, Ourselves. And if you remember that title, it will tell me how old you are. <laughs> and it was full of black and white 60s era photos and full of practical medical advice about the care and flourishing of women's bodies. And the book had a polemical subtext. Women, take back your bodies. Don't let someone else own them or tell you what to do with them. Don't let some doctor think that your body is just like a man's body and can be treated the same way. Don't buy into that ancient destructive idea that your body doesn't belong to you, or even more deeply, that your body is not essentially, fundamentally, who you are. Now, remarkably, those were revolutionary ideas at the time, in part because the book talked openly with illustrations about topics that previously were discussed behind closed doors. It used words that polite people did not say in public and still don't say in public, at least in church. But in retrospect, it was above all a practical guide to women's health. Now, I'm not here to talk about female bodies versus male bodies, but rather to talk about all our bodies as the primary site of God's action in the world. In that inclusive sense, the title of this lecture could be paraphrased as Our Bodies, Ourselves. How do we as Christians understand and speak about what it means to be embodied creatures in the world while recognizing, acknowledge dealing with the reality that different bodies are treated differently? How do we think about the relationship between our bodies and ourselves? How do we think about the relationship between individual physical bodies and metaphorical corporate bodies, including the body of Christ, but also including the social systems which we navigate every day. A widespread common view is that Christianity draws a line between our physical bodies and our individual immaterial souls, and that our bodies are bad, sinful, sources of corruption. They need to be starved or beaten down, denied, ignored. Bodies are dangerous. And some bodies, bodies that are different from us, whoever we are, are especially dangerous and need to be kept under control. And what's more, Paul is to blame for all of this. That's a view. I'm not saying I endorse that view. For anyone remotely awake, these are pressing questions, both personally and politically. Whether we are struggling with anorexia or abortion or institutional and personal racism or the care of people suffering from trauma or dementia or abuse or the interface between human beings and technology, the question of how we as persons are related to our bodies is central to questions of human flourishing. This morning we will take a look at some current scientific and philosophical theories about the body and Paul's body language, which is all over the place in his letters. So in recent years, there has been a real surge of interest in physical bodies as the location of personal identity over against post-enlightenment assumptions that the self resides in some immaterial and individual soul or an abstract, disembodied mental processes. This recent surge of interest has two main themes. It rejects a dualistic division between body and mind in individual selves, and it rejects any idea of the individual as autonomous, self-determining, and isolated from the surrounding environment. We are not the masters of our fate. We never act purely alone. We don't float above our bodies or escape from them at death and we can't retreat into a purely mental, abstract universe, 
This can be real news for faculty in some institutions. <clears throat> That's a laugh from the back of the room, I recognize it. There are no disembodied talking heads, no matter how much we think we might think we're a disembodied talking head, but only whole embodied people enmeshed in and shaped by their environments. Now what might Paul actually have to say about all this? In many circles, but hopefully not here, Paul is seen as the enemy. He's down on sex, down on bodies in general, down on women, down on gay people, just overall a downer. I sometimes go to science and religion conferences where I'm the only biblical scholar in the room. And when I tell people that I write about Paul, they look at me in polite disbelief. One woman said to me, all I know about Paul is his bad press. Now hopefully here in this context, in this reformed context, I expect, expect Paul gets a much better hearing. And that's really wonderful because Paul, Paul's body language is great news. So this morning I will make three claims about Paul's idea of the body. For Paul, our physical body is not a barrier but a bridge. That's point number one. Bodies don't separate us, they connect us. Skin is porous. It is not primarily what separates us from other people, it's not a boundary, but rather a medium of exchange between each of us and each other in our shared environment. For Paul, the body is all about connection and communication, not boundary, isolation, self-determination. Now this is also a picture of the body that is gaining increasing traction in current work in neuroscience and experimental psychology. I'll talk a bit about that shortly. Point number two, because our physical bodies connect us to other people and to our environment, they make us extremely vulnerable to the relationships as well as the physical world in which we live. That environment is also the site of toxic powers. At issue for Paul is always the issue of power and lordship. And these external factors exercise power and lordship. And they operate through human physical relationships as well as the environment. In Paul's worldview, those toxic powers exceed merely human capacities. They ex exceed human capacities. He names them sin and death. They operate in and through human relationships, but they are not reducible to individual human beings. I repeat that. Sin and death for Paul do not originate in us, but they operate in and through us, exercising power over us, and the body is the site of that operation of power. Point number three, Christ took on human flesh and blood. Christ became a body, we know this, the doctrine of the incarnation. He did this in the most marginalized and despised way imaginable in his context, in the context of the first century, as a slave and a crucified criminal. In so doing, he validated the worth of every human body, including and perhaps especially the bodies of those whom society deems worthless. Now these are all big claims, I cannot do them full justice in this hour, but perhaps they can get us thinking about Paul's good news for the body. So first, the physical body is not a barrier but a bridge. We may feel that we are isolated, alone in our room, a rock, an island, touching no one and no one touches us, but simply by virtue of being bodies, we are connected with others and shaped by them. Even when we're alone, our perspectives, our emotions, our patterns of thought are shaped by internalized primary relationships with others. Body language is all over the place in Paul's letter, but he never speaks of the body by itself. It is always related to something else that shapes and defines it. Here's some examples. Romans 7, 4. You have died to the law through the body of Christ. 724, who will deliver me from this body of death? Romans 6, 6, we know this, that our old self was co-crucified in order that the body of sin might be done away with, that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Romans 12, 5, 
Just as each of us has one body with many members, and not all the members have the same function, so in Christ we who are many are one body, and each member belongs to one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. In each of these verses, the simple observation is that body is defined by its relationship to something else. Body doesn't stand alone and is therefore not, in a sense, self-determining. In all of these cases, it is not always clear whether body refers to human beings or primarily to human beings or not. If it does, it denotes the human body as it belongs to or originates in something else perhaps Christ, perhaps death, perhaps sin. I'm looking at the structure of the grammar here. Alternatively, in some cases, human bodies may not be the primary referent at all. Of course, each case has to be decided in terms of its own context. So in Romans 7, 4, the body of Christ most likely refers to Christ's physical body crucified for all humanity. That's how I read that crucified in order to liberate all humanity from the grip of sin and death. But what is Paul's logic here? How can we die to sin through the physical body of Christ crucified on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago? That's always been one of the big questions, isn't it? For the crucifixion of Christ to affect us requires a logic different than the logic of modern individualism. It requires a logic of solidarity that extends across time and space through all of humanity. It seems that Paul believed in something like the butterfly effect. Some way we could think about this. I mean, the butterfly effect in chaos theory in physics says that the beating of a, a that a tiny change in a in an early initial state, a, a nonlinear system or state can affect major change down the line. That the fluttering of a butterfly's wings on one part of the globe can change the weather in another part of the globe. That's the colloquial idea of the butterfly effect. Well, it's a nice metaphor, I think, for something that goes on in Paul. Paul's logic depends on the fact that God is Lord over both time and space and works in it without being limited by it, and also chooses to work always to deal with humanity in corporeal form. In other words, one man's crucifixion and resurrection changed the weather of the cosmos, we might say. Now, Paul's logic says that uh, through baptism, we have solidarity with and participate in Christ's crucifixion, which in turn delivers us from another body, what Paul calls the body of sin. What about that body of sin? Is it simply a sinful human body? Well, that doesn't seem to get at the whole picture because Paul immediately says, so that you might no longer be enslaved to sin, as if sin is something distinct from us that holds us captive. Again, when Paul says, let not sin have free reign or lord it over your mortal bodies, and later in Romans 6, There is an implicit distinction between sin and our bodies. Sin is something that lords us over us. So perhaps a better understanding is that the body of sin means the body as it belongs to sin or is in the grip of sin. But even that doesn't quite get at it because it is really not our bodies that are done away with. Because later Paul will talk about our bodies as the site of God's revelation and the site in which we fight against um, unrighteousness. So it's not our bodies that are done away with, it is the body of sin, which apparently means something like sin's hold on the body, in which there's a distinction between sin and the body, and yet the body can be so gripped by sin that it almost becomes indistinguishable. So it's the body's, uh, sin's hold on the body, sin's determination of our bodies that's done away with. We could think about what that would look like. But first we'll go on a little bit with Paul's uh, text itself. Bodies are vulnerable to sin and death, porous, inhabited, or colonized by sin as a foreign, hostile agency. 
Now this agency, it, this power ends in death. So in Romans 7, 24, the meaning of this body of death is parallel with the meaning of the body of sin. It probably refers to the physical human body as gripped or determined by sin's reign and thereby death's power. In this way, as bodies, we are connected, entangled in systemic and harmful falsehood and destruction. The bodies are also the way in which we participate in God's activity in the world and the way in which we share with others in the corporate metaphorical body of Christ. Christ became a physical human body and a divinely sustained solidarity with Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are part of his body. As Paul puts it, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now, Paul's logic of the body as solidarity underlines all these statements. In each case, the body connects us to other things. On the one hand, sin and death. On the other hand, Christ and other members of the body of Christ. By speaking this way, the apostle makes it clear that physical bodies are very much at risk. They are places where destructive powers can have a heyday. And if anybody's ever worked with, been close to someone struggling with addiction, for example, we know what that can look like. But they are also what mediates our necessary connections to the life-giving power of God. So Bishop John A.T. Robinson, in a little book called The Body several decades ago, summed this up. Solidarity is the divinely ordained structure in which personal life is to be lived. It is from the body of sin and death that we are delivered. It is through the body of Christ on the cross that we are saved. It is into his body, the church, that we are incorporated. It is by his body in the Eucharist that this community is sustained. It is in our body that its new life has to be manifested. It is to a resurrection of this body to the likeness of his glorious body that we are destined. That pretty much sums it up right there. So our physical bodies connect us, entangle us in larger social and spiritual bodies for good and for ill. As bodies, we can't help belonging to someone or something outside ourselves. And much as we may want to put up a sign saying no trespassing, we're already occupied territory. To our ears, that may sound like a very shocking claim, but I think that as far as Paul is concerned, that's a reality we need to grapple with. This is not a statement about how things should be, but the recognition of how things are. The poet John Donne expressed this famously when he said, no man is an island entire of itself. Each is a part of the main. A philosopher named Timothy Chapel, British philosopher, he interpreted it this way. No human starts out as an island. Each of us at least begins as a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Insofar as we ever come to be anything like entire of ourselves, this is a learned and socialized achievement, an achievement, moreover, that is necessarily built on our prior status as parts of the main. In a word, individuality presupposes relationality. Now, Dunn and Chapel are expressing an ancient insight drawn from Scripture, including the letters of Paul. But that insight got lost along the way, displaced by an idea of human beings as essentially, fundamentally isolated individuals. We start out alone, and then we achieve relationship. That's the idea. The fascinating thing is that this connected, participatory understanding of what it means to be a person is now being recovered by the cognitive sciences. The scientists don't explain Paul's understanding of bodies and selves. They don't explain, they don't prove, but they do give us some new ways of talking about Paul's anthropology, some new metaphors, if you will. So to illustrate that point, here are some contemporary examples of ways that as bodies we participate in our surroundings and they participate in us. As we shall see, a great deal then depends on the qualities of the physical and relational surroundings in which we live and move and have our being. So the first example is drawn from biology. Think of this as a metaphor. It's not an explanation, it's a metaphor. 
We are colonized territories because our bodies are not barriers, but mediate a constant traffic between what's outside and what's inside. Here's a picture of that in a purely physical sense. It's called the human microbiome. Has anybody heard of the human microbiome? <laughs> okay. The human, I learned about this from a, one of my students actually. The human microbiome refers to the existence of microbial communities of alien cells that outnumber human cells in the body by up to 10 to 1. Did you know this? We are really colonies, colonized. In fact, in an article called Some of My Best Friends Are Germs, essayist Michael Pollan writes that he considers himself 10% human. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> I'm 10% human because more than, you know, 90% uh, of my body is, is these alien microbial communities. These cells colonize parts of the human body, primarily our guts. And research increasingly shows that they affect moods and cognition to the point that some call the microbiome a second brain. There actually was a, a, a big day-long conference on the gut-brain connection at Duke just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is really cutting edge right now. <clears throat> it's an intriguing picture of a very physical way in which our bodies are porous, connected to the outside environment, and affected in ways of which we are largely unaware. This is, of course, not what Paul is saying, but it gives us a nice vivid image of, of, of the porosity and vulnerability and yet life-giving necessity of bodies as connection. Now, other metaphors can be found in neuroscience experimental psychology. For example, we now know, and this has made a big splash in the news, that the same visual motor neurons that are activated in the prefrontal cortex when someone does an action are activated when someone else watches the action. This is called mirror neurons, and it's, there are lots of columns about mirror neurons in the New York Times, but it basically is this basic idea. When I pick up this glass, motor neurons are activated in my neural system, the neurons necessary for picking up this glass and taking a drink. But the same thing, the same neurons are being activated in all of your neural systems as you watch me do this. The neurons that would be necessary to pick up the glass are activated by the perception or observation of someone else picking up the glass. That's the basic idea of mirror neurons. Now, the interesting thing is what that might mean for the ways in which our bodies are connecting us subpersonally, subconsciously with others all the time. So Vittorio Galese, who was one of the Italian scientists that discovered mirror neurons, he philosophizes about this a lot. And he says that this neural activity, which is a shared activity between us, uh, opens up what he calls a we-centric space with a shared semantic content generated by the parallel activity of our neural systems. Now, there's a lot of debate about what claims can be made on the basis of this parallel neural activity, but it does seem that we can at least say there's a neurobiological basis for a shared experience, a shared bodily experience, like the experience of watching someone playing, watching a football game and finding that your knee, is, your leg is jerking because you want to make a kick, you know, <laughs> or watching someone on a high wire and finding your body tensing. That neurobiological basis indicates our bodies are communicating with each other. Not because we will it. There imit there's an imitation involved, a propensity towards imitation, not willed, but built in. Now, evidence from experimental psychology also demonstrates that our bodies have this propensity to generate connections with other people. This is most evident in studies of imitation and gesture. So there are very established studies now that newborn infants, within an hour of birth sometimes, will imitate facial expressions, facial gestures, sticking out the tongue. These have been widely um, tested around the world. It's as if the babies, the newborns, are somehow seeing themselves through their parents, the other's gaze, they can't have, they don't even know what it would mean. What would it mean to say the infant knows it has a face at that point? 
but the body makes this happen. Congenitally blind people will sometimes gesture while talking with other blind people. There are lots of studies of this. Are patients who have lost the proprioceptive feedback loop in their body there so they don't know without looking at their foot what their foot is doing or without looking at their hands what their hands are doing uh, still will gesture when telling a story. Something about the body wants to communicate. So philosopher Sean Gallagher, who's written a book called How the Body Shapes the Mind, he says it this way. He says, Before you know it, your body makes you human. What he means is this. Before you know it, your body connects you with other people to the vulnerable and life-giving and necessary interchange that is part and parcel of being a human being and shapes who we are. We are not neutral. We are not freestanding. We are not rugged individuals. We are connected. Now, we don't have to go into these worlds of microbiology or neuroscience or studies of infants to find examples of the ways in which bodily connection, existence, connects us to our environments and in a way makes us belong to them. Because we live in a culture that lays claim to our bodies all the time in vastly different ways, depending on the shape and color and communities of our bodies, our personal histories, our gender, and so forth. What are commercials and online ads, if not ways of laying claim to our bodies in order to make money off us by telling us how we need to be different? Even prior to this, as bodies, we belong to our families of origin and resist though we might, and we may resist mightily, we are still shaped by the relationships and conversations in which we grew up. This is wonderful and pernicious, life-giving and lethal because our worth is so tied in to the ways in which others view us, which includes the ways others view our bodies. This is not unique to American culture or Western culture or modern culture. It is true in varied ways around the world. It is also true in the first century world of Paul. Now, Paul and his contemporaries didn't know about the microbiome or neuroscience or experimental psychology, although they really did know a lot about imitation. They did know about the many ways in which the body is shaped by its environment, and they did think there is a constant interchange between the inner and the outer in the construction of identity. They also saw the body as porous and malleable, something that can and should be shaped by society, beginning at home and extending through education, especially for the wealthy and privileged. Here are a couple of ways in which this took place. First, on a continuum with the larger social and cosmic realities in which it is embedded, the ancient Greco, Greeks, and Romans saw the human body as literally a microcosm of the cosmos. It shares the same elements and mimetically corresponds to its larger matrix. When current scientists say, like it's news, we're made of star stuff, this goes back to Carl Sagan, well, they knew that. There's nothing new. They saw, particularly the Stoics, saw the body on a continuum with everything else in the natural order. The body was seen as porous and of a peace with the elements surrounding it and pervading it. The surface of the body is not a sealed boundary. That's a quote from Dale Martin, a New Testament scholar. So that means that breaks down uh, divisions between a presumed inner self in a psychological or mental sense, and an outer self. And we can see in the ancient philosophers a negotiation of how to navigate the need for some kind of boundary in the absence of a boundary. And that means, second then, that the lack of firm boundaries means the body is pliable, easily shaped. So Roman physicians told upper-class parents to massage the bodies of their infant sons with the goal of shaping them into beautiful, masculine bodies that conformed to the values of a very hierarchical, status-conscious society. The basic idea was that society molds the self. So as Martin puts it, the shape of the body and its inner constitution are thus subject to the molding of civilization. The idea of a self left to grow all by itself appears to have been unthinkable. Even before birth, through instructions given to pregnant women, 
the infant's body was seen as intimately shaped by its environment. Now, once again, the overlaps with current research on the brain are really striking. The effects of the relational and physical environment on infant development are well documented from the effects of lead poisoning, of course, to, on mental development, to the effects of abandonment or abuse in infant development, to the psychological effects of communal as well as physical stress on children and adults. I mean, there's a lot going on on this. So the ancient views of the body come with an odd shock of familiarity. There is a feedback loop between our bodies and our brains, and what's more, between our bodies and our brains and what is out here. The way Sean Gallagher puts it, we are not just what happens in our brains. The loop that is the system of the self that we are extends through and is limited by our bodily capacities into the surrounding environment, which is social as well as physical, and feeds back through our conscious experience into the decisions we make. This loop is the true size of the system that we are, the larger system of body, environment, intersubjectivity. In both ancient and contemporary pictures of the self, there's a constant traffic then between what's out here and what's in here through the porous surface of the body. With immediate and far-reaching implications for the psychological and physical well-being of the person. So these Parallels between ancient and modern views of the body generate further questions about the relationship between individual and corporate bodies. Granted that in the ancient world, bodies were permeable, unbounded, and of a piece with their environment, does this mean there was no self in the ancient world? And this is a big philosophical debate among classicists, <clears throat> and Pauline scholars for that matter. And my answer is yes and no. Certainly there was no abstract concept of individuals as autonomous and discrete, self-determining people. Nonetheless, I think there was a self. There was someone who can and does say I as the subject of the verb. <laughs> there are complex issues in Hellenistic philosophy around this, but I think it's safe to say that Paul was not bashful about using the pronoun I to refer to himself. I think it's safe to say that Paul had a very robust sense of himself as an agent in a complicated way. Even when acting alone, Paul is never acting on his own because there's an I, yet not I, but Christ in me who acts, and yet the I is still the subject of verbs. He has an I, but not an I alone, an I in relationship. This is a self with a relational ground of being, a self whose agency exists in and through the indwelling Christ, a self with an ontologically dyadic, at the least, self, we might say. But it's not only in Christ for Paul that the self is never distinct, never acts on its own, because the self in relation to sin also has a kind of dual agency. It's not as if we are isolated, lonely, self-determining individuals who make a decision to participate in Christ and then acquire a new agency that is an agency shared with Christ. Because we're never the isolated, self-determining individuals, ever. We never can stand outside of the systems and the powers. We just don't, we can't do that. There's no place for that in the cosmos. So the self, not in relationship to Christ, is, has a relationship to sin and a kind of dual agency. This becomes most clear in the famous passage, Romans 7, where Paul says, and I'll paraphrase here, I don't understand my own actions. I don't do what I want to do. I do what I hate. Now, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, it's no longer I doing it, but sin dwelling in me. He repeats it twice. If I do what I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin dwelling in me. The structure is parallel to the structure in Galatians 2, the structure where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. That is, in the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> 
There's an I, yet not I, but another dwelling in me. And the structures are parallel here, but what differs is the other I, and that's all the difference. When the other, the, as the other indwelling agent, when the other indwelling agent is sin, something comes between the desire of the I, the self that speaks, and its outcome, and that is sin. But when the other agent or the other entity is Christ, then that I continues to act. I live. I no longer live. I've died. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, and I live in the flesh, in the faith. So the I constituted in relationship to Christ is an I that has an agency that is robust and activated. And the I constituted or under the power of sin as an indwelling and yet external reality is an I evacuated of its agency, of its capacity to, to accomplish what it wants, which what it wants is the good. So once again, the language is the language of solidarity. The logic is the logic of solidarity. And the identity of the other with whom we are in solidarity is a matter of life and death. This is not optional. This is life and death. And these others are superhuman, sin with a capital S, and of course Christ. But these realities of these dual agencies, we might say, are acted out in the qualities of embodied social actions among us, whether that be the corrosive, debilitating, false, ultimately lethal effects of sin, or the life-giving fruits of the spirit of Christ in the midst of the community of faith. To summarize thus far, we find in both ancient and contemporary thought the idea that bodies connect us to our surroundings, acting as conductors between us and those around us, so much so that we internalize the relationships in which we live and move, and they become constitutive of who we are. The ground of our being is relational and embodied, and as such, we participate in and are under the power of sin and death, apart from Christ, We are in the situation Paul depicts in Romans 7. But also, in Christ, we participate bodily in life-giving relational systems. Now, how do we move from one to the other? Well, that's always the big question, isn't it? And the interesting thing is this. We don't simply choose to switch sides because the connections that our bodies make with our environments make it impossible for us to step outside of those connections in order to make some kind of a individual free choice. (laughs) No, we are too enmeshed from birth on. It takes a divine action to set us free and to remake us from the ground up in a new relational system, a new socially embodied, embodied set of interactions. And that happens in two ways, both of which take place in bodily form. And the first, of course, is that God acts in this relational embodied system, the true size of the system we are, in Galaga's terms, by sending God's Son into the world in the likeness of sinful flesh, I'm quoting Romans 8, so that in God in Christ becomes one of us, embodied, embedded in this systemic reality, yet not fully constituted by it. God takes on flesh in the form of a slave and a crucified criminal, as Paul says in Philippians 2, so that the divine participation in the human body and bodily form all the way to death is God's way of redeeming our bodies. The logic of solidarity finds its basis in God's solidarity with all humanity. The logic of participation finds its basis in God's participation in human bodily existence. Humanity at its most marginalized, human beings at the limits of society, human beings under the threat and condemnation of death. So that's the first way in which God acts in to redeem our bodies by becoming a body. And then secondly, uh, Paul says that God redeems our body by the body of Christ. So, I think I'm missing a page. Here we go. Yeah, all right. 
through the corporate body of Christ indwelt by the Spirit, participated by in by human physical bodies that belong to one another through the mimetic interchange in which we, which we become transformed. So the second way in which God acts to remake us is this new social system, the place where human bodies may be affirmed in relationships characterized by gift rather than by achievement, by mutual honor and respect rather than shame, by difference rather than conformity, by vocation rather than privilege. What could be more affirming of the body? And not just upper class elite bodies, what I call California bodies. I grew up in California, so I have the right to say that. <clears throat> Toned and honed and fit and well off, but low class outsider bodies. What could be more affirming than the incarnation of the Son of God in the body of a slave undergoing the most despicable, dehumanizing kind of execution known in the Roman Empire? Every kind of body is included here. Every kind of body counts. Every kind of body has a place. This means, finally, that our bodies are the places where Christ is revealed and made known. They are the site of revelation. Now, and that's quite a remarkable thing to think about. Now, Paul says this in many ways as he instructs his converts on how to use their bodies as weapons of righteousness and as he contemplates his own body which by his own account was not much to look at. We have our sleek, good-looking TV personalities today. The ancient world had the same. A public speaker was expected to be good-looking, physically fit, powerful, impressive, with a great voice. You're, the, the medium is the message. The medium was the message in the ancient world, as it is today. And Paul describes himself as appearing weak in body and unimpressive in speech. His body was probably a mass of scars, really hard to look at. If we think about it, he had scars from being whipped, scars from being stoned. We don't know what his voice was. It was probably high and thin, you know? I, one time I gave a sermon in which I said Mary might have been fat and pimply for all we know. You know, we, we, we have our images that we project. But in fact, we don't, you know, the, the text just doesn't say that. What we have from Paul is that his body was one that would make people ashamed, that would make people want to spit him out, literally. And he saw his body as the message. The medium is the message, but the message is radically different. So he was a poor joke of a public speaker in terms of ancient culture, and yet he never hesitates to view his body as a billboard for Jesus. I think that would be a fair thing to say about Paul's understanding of his body. Because, of course, what is he proclaiming but the crucifixion of the Son of God on our behalf? So writing to the Corinthians, he says, we have this treasure in clay pots to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be also manifested in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, Paul can say this because he has hope. As he says shortly after, this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, because we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is, through the manifestation of hope, in the face of suffering and death, Paul, in his body, displays his solidarity with Christ, who joins with us in solidarity with our suffering and death. Again, writing to the Philippians from prison and facing the real possibility of a public execution, Paul writes, <clears throat> 
It is my eager expectation and hope that I shall not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. The body is the site of death for all of us, and the body is the site of resurrection. And in that incommensurable reality, the reality of God in Christ becomes visible. The visibility of death, but the visibility of resurrection hope. Whether healed or not healed, the body is the site of hope. Now we could say, well, that's just Paul. He was a special case. But I think Paul very much intends his converts to see their bodies as places where Christ is glorified. Yes, this is through treating our bodies as belonging to God, as given up to God's service. It is through offering our bodies to God as, in Paul's language, weapons of righteousness. And at the same time, it is in our weakness, our frailty, our thorns in the flesh, ultimately even our death, that Christ's solidarity with all of us, all humanity, is shown forth. So if Paul writes warnings about how to act and what we do as bodies, that's because he takes the importance of the body very seriously. Our bodies are the place where God's grace and power are displayed, not by virtue of being beautiful, but by virtue of Christ's solidarity with us, whether in our suffering and death or in our healing and life. Paul's gospel is profoundly pro-body. Thank you. This is how things will go. Um, I will invite you to ask a question, and um, I will give you a microphone by which you can be heard asking your question. Uh, Please state your name uh, and uh, your connection here with the uh, with the school, pastor, professor, student, whatever, uh, and uh, then uh, ask your question. All right, who wants to go first? Always the challenge to go first. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Chase Solick. I'm on the faculty in health ministries and nursing. Great. And I'm interested in your second point in talking about the vulnerability of the body. I don't know what opportunities there were in Paul's time in terms of addictions. Um, it's an issue that we really are, are you know, struggle with uh, today. And and we are um, doing an event in November on the church and addictions. But I'm interested in the question about our relationship to virtual bodies and the internet, thinking particularly of the problem with uh, pornography, where you can be in relationship with a body that doesn't exist exist in reality, or with a body that's disembodied because it's, you know, a person who you're not physically connected to. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how, what would Paul have to say to us mm-hmm. about that challenge in terms of uh, being subject to that power? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A, a wonderful question. I, I actually just a couple of weeks ago was at a, uh, a, a workshop in short course at Cambridge on this, the question of uh, human identity in the age of machines and artificial intelligence, which also, in, then it also includes virtual reality. And so, um, and my job was to bring a sort of a theological perspective to this, and biblical perspective to this discussion. Um, so I think that's a really hot and important issue. Um, and we know a lot of studies now being done about what is happening. I mean, not just with the, like pornography, but in general, when, when kids grow up, where their primary interface is a machine rather than a person, or is a virtual reality that's disembodied, um, and that the idea, it, we live at this really weird time where 
the science is telling us that our bodies are absolutely, we can't disembody our identity. You know, that's the science. The science is going in that direction. And the technology and the practices are going towards disembodiment more and more and more. And the problem with disembodiment like that is that there's no accountability. There's no, um, there's the illusion of control. I think that Paul would, I mean, this is, Paul wasn't facing this issue. But I think Paul's logic says that this is extremely dangerous, that this is, um, we need bodily, church can't just be done online, you know. <laughs> we need the bodily face-to-face uh, because that is the form in which God took and because, to act in human history. So I think he would see that as another instance of the way in which sin gets a grip on us. That's, I mean, that's a, a blunt, but I think he would see it that way. And he would see, I would think, would say that the intervention has to happen in human embodied interactions. You know, as opposed to, I know there are now psychiatric or, or um, psychological robots that people interact with. I mean, it's really weird what's out there that I'm finding out about. And I just think that's not the same as an encounter with an other person who is different from us, not pre-programmed, and can form a genuine empathetic bond, which is necessary to break the powers of addiction. I mean, addictions require a community to break them, and we, we know that, and an alternative community that is real. So I, I don't know if that's answering your question, but you know, I think it's an excellent illustration of the ways in which the loop, when the loop is more with machines than people, we're in trouble. But we are in that situation now, and it's a serious situation, I think. Is, is that? Yeah, OK. Hello, my name is Damon Honecker, and I'm a uh, seminary student here. Uh, I have a question for you about uh, the two questions that you just uh, mentioned in the very beginning about how does change occur, and then how do we uh, sustain that change? Uh, uh, keeping the things you've discussed in light, like um, uh, the body of Christ, uh, Christ as body, mm -hmm. and then a right uh, reaction or response to mental illness. Mm -hmm. You mean how should the body of Christ think about mental illness and help, is that what the question? Yes, that's always uh, at the forefront, but then more specifically your two questions in mind. With those things in mind, how can uh, we keep it in mind that um, how do people change, and then how can we help to sustain that change from yeah. the illness portion to acceptance to uh, viability and thriving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. These are wonderful questions. Um, the next book wants to deal with that. <laughs> I want to deal with that in the next, really think about sort of the, the so what of, um, of the enacting of this understanding of, of selves in relationship, including with issues of mental illness. I would just say, in, I mean, I don't have an, the answer to this because I think it's extremely complex and difficult in every situation. I would say a couple of things. I would say, one, that um, there are forms of mental illness that are there for life. And to think that we, we can change someone completely is we, we need what a, Paul, a biblical scholar would call eschatological reservation. <laughs> that there's a sense in which um, this side of the eschaton, we live with incompleteness and imperfection. And so we, uh, what psychologists will call the mythology of resolution, we need to live with, with you know, somebody's not completely cured. And, and I think that that um, gives patience. It's really important to have patience over time, because God's time frame is different than ours. And so, in, in viewing a person with mental illness, which can be so tragic, so destructive, so difficult, um, the, the patience and the hope to sustain relationship over time 
when change doesn't seem to happen, that comes from that eschatological hope that God is pulling everybody into the future. And in the future, God's pulling of us into the future, the, the uh, things that, that hold us back will be done away with. They've been done away with ontologically on the cross, but experientially, it takes more than a lifetime. So I, I would say that. Um, and then the, another thing that I would say is that the, one of the ways of thinking about Paul's gospel of grace and gift is how, how that constitutes a community and the quality of communal interactions that will facilitate change and sustain people through success and failure. And that is that um, grace is an unconditioned gift. And it's a relational gift that in which uh, conditions, uh, preconditions, are done away with. And so insofar as that shapes a community, it shapes a community in which um, that unconditioned gift is extended, mediated through other people, extended into the community. And that, um, I think, is necessary for a community to continue to accept and reckon with uh, and, and support as much as pop- possible people with mental illness. Um, as opposed to uh, something in which if they don't change, they're out. The if, the if then, <laughs> uh, is, is, uh, can't sustain, can't sustain a community over time. Yeah, is that a couple of thoughts? Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for that question. It's an important question. My name is Hannah Andre, and I teach here history. Mm-hmm. And I just wondered if you could clarify that in your discussion or consideration of body, whether you include the brain in body or distinguish it from body, and then secondly, whether you're viewing mind and brain as synonyms or still wanting to retain some non-physical component of the person, and yeah. then what yeah. difference that makes for our consideration of the body, um, however that's, you know, how that's defined as a, a, a site of sin, of redemption, um, and revelation. Yeah, great question. It's a big debate in philosophy right now, as you know, yeah. Is there a non-mental mind? Because mind seems to, um, to include what philosophers call qualia or qualia that, that cannot be reduced to a physical event and, and are very hard to pin down, but there's something in us that we know experientially. Uh, and, and even in the studies of the brain, there's something that can watch the brain being studied. I think that's, in a sense, um, what you're talking about. And um, the way I would think about this, and I, I confess I'm still thinking about it, you know, because it's a very hard question. Um, but from a Pauline perspective, as best I can think about it, uh, Paul does not conceptualize a disembodied self. Now, there are different kinds of bodies. And he talks about this famously in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about resurrection. He talks about different kinds of bodies. But he doesn't conceptualize a disembodied self. But yet, what kinds of bodies there are, is that's a big and complicated question. And I confess, I, I don't fully know what Paul means when he talks about that. Um, but if we think of... If we think of the self as always constituted foundationally, ontologically, in relationship with God, ultimately, then, then we don't, it's not a question of a, an individual mind or soul and an individual body, discrete. The, 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 the ancient or really Cartesian dualism between a disembodied mind or soul and a in a body, in an individual sense. Because there is not that individual in that freestanding sense. And so therefore, if I think about, for example, what happens at death, you know, 
it's, it's that the, um, the whole self is in relationship to God. And insofar as there is an immaterial transcendence of the self, it's constituted not in terms of an individual non-material mind or soul, but in terms of the way in which I as a whole am related to God in Christ through the spirit, which is immaterial. I don't think that spirit is material. I, can't, I disagree with some, a few scholars on that, <clears throat> modern scholars on that. Uh, so insofar as I'm constituted in relationship to the spirit, there is this immaterial mind, but it's not an individual essence, immaterial essence. It's a relational reality. Does that make some sense? I'm trying to reframe it so we get away from individual mind or soul, body distinctions to a transcendence an immater that is immaterial, but it's in relationship to God. That's not a full answer to your question, but it's trying to reframe the question in terms of this, this um, ontologically, I would call it second person perspective on, on uh, who we are. It's a partial answer, yeah. Hello, my name is Shauna Hart, and I'm a Masters of Divinity student here at North Park. And um, one of your last quotes, one of the last things you said is that the body is the site of hope, and it's the offering that Christ made. And uh, kind of my, my thought process is, um, but what about when it isn't the site of hope, um, such as... Um, him talking about mental illness or chronic pain. Um, you were talking about it requiring logic and solidarity. Um, and I, I know that you said the answer is in with it is community related with mental illness. But when you have pain, chronic pain, and someone can't see it, and it's, um, it's hard to express it when it's, when it's unknown, to anyone else, you kind of bear it by yourself. Mm -hmm. You carry the load alone. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question is, when the body is the side of hope, what about when it isn't? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The physical body. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I think what you're describing beautifully and um, importantly, is the reality that in this in this existence, we we have we are we participate in and are participated in by God in Christ through the body of Christ. But we're also this side of death and resurrection. We're also entangled in the systemic reality of sin and death. And so the church is never perfect. The capacity to know and be known is always limited. I'll talk about that a bit next, in the next lecture. Uh, and experientially, it can be very different than this sort of glorious picture I've painted. Absolutely. And it's really important. I, and I put that under the heading of eschatological reservation. That's a fancy way of saying it. But it's really important to name that, as you just have. Uh, because when it's named, it's validated. The experience is validated. If we name the reality of the experience that, in fact, oftentimes in churches, people suffer alone. There are many reasons for that. One reason is that it doesn't feel safe to name, name the suffering, especially kind, some kinds of suffering are safe to name and others aren't. Uh, that has to do with when a community is not really constituted radically around the gift, around grace and few communities are, um, if that even is named, it begins to open up. This is what pastors have to do. <laughs> this is the pastoral job, to open up the place by naming the, the lack, and naming the loneliness, naming the sin, naming all of that, so that it may be possible for it to be made known and then c experienced communally. Um, so I just honor that reality uh, that you've described. Um, I mean, I think from a divine perspective, from God's perspective, God is present. 
but it needs to be experienced with other people. And that requires the quality of community where these things can be named because churches can be lonely places. That's true. Yeah. Well, we are we're coming to the end of our question time, unfortunately. Um, and uh, we'll have another opportunity at the end of the next lecture. Will you remind us then what the next uh, lecture will focus on? Oh, it's on? called Knowing God, Knowing God, Cognition and the Spirit. It's focused mainly on Romans 8. Yeah, so. Okay, so uh, now we have our coffee break. Uh, and uh, down in the, in the lounge, and uh, we'll ring a bell when it's time to come back. Uh, and so the sooner you get back and we hear the lecture, the sooner you'll be able to ans ask some of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Eastman. Thank you.